Welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, CRM Applied Math seminar and uh, a very great pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Russell Luke from uh, University of uh, Göttingen, um, almost my hometown. And uh, <clears throat> so Russell uh, got his PhD uh, in 2001 at University of Washington with uh, Jim Burke. And then he went on to do a postdoc in, at the uh, Institut für Numerische und Angewandte Mathematik in Göttingen, then uh, had a postdoc stint at Simon Fraser as a PIMS uh, postdoc fellow. Then he was assistant and eventually associate professor at University of Delaware and then moved to uh, University of Göttingen in 2010, where he's now a W3 or full professor uh, at the Institute of Numerische and Angewandte Mathematik. And uh, his special specializations are in uh, optimization, optimization algorithms theory, monotone operator theory, and uh, numerical applications of uh, algorithms for monotone operators. And uh, he's going to talk about something along these lines today. Okay, thanks, Tim. And thanks for the invitation. And it's so nice to see so many friends in, in the audience. <clears throat> um, this is my fourth hour of lectures today. So if I'm a little hoarse, it's not because I have COVID, uh, but a uh, little, little talked out. But <clears throat> so this is going to be about joint work that I did with uh, Mark Tabul and Shom Sabach in the course of a, of a gift grant that we had. <clears throat> um, but it, it'll also touch on, on work that I've been doing with students here in Göttingen um, on analysis of, of some algorithms. So the central problem is what I call the cone and sphere problem. <clears throat> and this very vaguely stated is, is find a point nearest in some sense to a cone and to spheres in the image of affine transformations. And this captures some um, applications that I've uh, been occupied with for a large part of my career. Um, <clears throat> mathematically, what it, it, we have these uh, affine transformations, actually F is a linear transformation. Uh, and I split up the dimension of the space uh, as Rd to the power n, uh, because what I'm after is D is going to be either two or three. Uh, for, for a phase retrieval type problem, it'll be R2 to the power n, because I'm modeling the, the complex plane as, as R2. And then for the power n would be however many pixels are in my, the image that I take in a, in a x-ray diffraction um, uh, experiment. Or if you're doing source localization, which will be the other main application, d will be three, and that'll be your position in space, and n will be <clears throat> the number of, uh, of sensors you have there. <clears throat> PJ is going to be another transformation uh, maintaining uh, the, the dimensionality that just um, helps me uh, reflect various uh, parameter settings or, or um, uh, fine tuning uh, uh, of, of different experiments. But the, the basic physics would be described by this, this F mapping, like a Fourier transform or something like that. And the PEJs would just describe various settings of the instrument, like defocus or, or different wavelengths or something like this. And I would take M images or, or, or run through M experiments and collect uh, <clears throat> these uh, images. And these images will be d-dimensional vectors, and I'll, I'll have n pixels or voxels of these uh, in these images. <clears throat> and so I'm and I'm I'm looking for vectors, any vector that satisfies the measurements. So the bijs would be for the jth experiment in the ith pixel position or voxel position. There's going to be some intensity measurement or a, or a distance uh, reading or something like this. <clears throat> so that's my data. <clears throat> and my model for that data is given on the left-hand side here uh, by this, this transformation of, of my unknown Z 
and the ith pixel of that uh, or ith element of that has norm b given by bj. So these are spheres, actually. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and I've got n of these spheres in the domain or in the image of this, this mapping. And to each one of these sets, I can add uh, a qualitative constraint set, which I'll usually reserve C naught for. Um, and that'll be something like support or non-negativity or sparsity or symmetry or something like this. And, and so this, and all of these are cones. So, so this is where the, the spheres under some affine transformation uh, and the intersection of those with a cone. That's my basic problem. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to learn more about problems like this, I'm very proud to announce uh, this book that just came out in 2020, Nanoscale Photonic Imaging. This is sort of a valedictory lap, um, closing out a collaborative research center that we had in Göttingen um, that ran for 12 years. Uh, and it was a collaboration between physicists and mathematicians and statisticians and uh, biomolecular physicists at Göttingen. <clears throat> and, uh, and I just got most of the PIs, uh, I could cajole them into writing a chapter for this book um, <clears throat> describing their accomplishments over the last 12 years. So we have 23 chapters. It's a, it's a big book. Um, during the course of the center, one of the, the team members was awarded a Nobel Prize, Stefan Hell, uh, for uh, his stead imaging uh, technique. <clears throat> and there are lots of demos and data associated uh, that, that you can uh, find uh, in this book. So I encourage you, and it's open source, so you can download it for free. Um, and it's, it's got a lot of good stuff on, on that, the, the sort of at the interface of mathematics and applications. So in specifically the applications um, that I was interested in and still am, <clears throat> uh, on the left, this is one application. This is a, a this part of it is a phase retrieval um, type of problem. The, the, the problem is you, you send some molecule through a, a very intense laser pulse. This would be from a synchron radiation source that these synchrotron sources are huge. They're sort of the size of cities, uh, at least the tubes that they um, need to generate these pulses. And <clears throat> they, they uh, send this pulse through a stream of molecules and the molecules can be any, any rotation. And they don't know the rotation of the molecules, but when they, when they blast these molecules, you get a diffraction pattern from the molecules and, and you'll get a whole terabyte, say, of these types of diffraction patterns, which you have to order somehow according to what, what you think the orientation uh, corresponding to that particular image was. And you put this all together and you get this three-dimensional sphere. And this three-dimensional sphere is the, <clears throat> uh, is the magnitude. And so all the colors represent the, the, these are intensity measurements of the complex valued field at the image plate. And <clears throat> so you'll get the sphere of, that's a sort of a measurement of the field. Uh, uh, and this plate is basically at infinity uh, relative to the wavelength of the X-ray source. Um, so you're measuring the, the amplitude of the field uh, in this three-dimensional sphere. And then if you could recover the, the, co the complex coordinates for those amplitude measurements, the real and imaginary part, you would then just compute the inverse Fourier transform of that and you would get back a picture of a molecule. That would be the, that would be the, uh, the electron configuration of that molecule. And so what these, what these images represent actually are basically the probability density functions for the electrons of this molecule. And so the phase retrieval part of this whole problem uh, involves just recovering the real and imaginary parts corresponding to these intensity measurements so that then you can just invert it and, and recover the, the uh, molecule. That can be modeled as a cone and sphere problem. Each of these 
each pixel of these measurements of these images is the bij in the previous slide and so uh, the and the dimension d in that previous slide let's go page up the dimension d there is two because we're just that's the complex plane um, <clears throat> and my my affine transformation is the Fourier transform here. I know it's a, a Fourier transform is the physical model for this. And then the PIJs really just represent you know, various things about the instrument that I have here. So that's, that's the main application that's covered in that book. Um, but there's another important application. Um, <clears throat> a lot of uh, engineers interested in the source localization problem. And it's just a triangulation problem. You have, you have, um, you have an emitter somewhere here and you have receivers at various positions and you know the position of the receivers. And the receivers can tell, they, they receive the signal from the emitter. <clears throat> and this receiver can tell the distance uh, from this receiver to the emitter, but it can't tell where the emitter is. It's just getting a, a distance measurement or the signal that tells it what the distance is. So from the signal read by this receiver, uh, there, it, all that receiver knows is that there is some uh, emitter on this circle. But then you've got another receiver over here. It's receiving the same signal. And it says, ah, okay, I, there has to be a, an emitter somewhere on this circle. If you just had two receivers, then there could be, a, and if you just said, okay, they have to, so they have to that single receiver um, or single emitter um, has to correspond to the signals received by both of those receivers. Then you would say, oh, there's a there's a receiver either there or an emitter either there or there. Now, if I had a third, then you have a third circle in there, and that will presumably then uniquely identify where that where that transmitter was. <clears throat> but that's also a a cone and sphere problem where their d is three. Because it's you know, a, your uh, latitude, longitude, and perhaps altitude for these for these um, receivers. Um, <clears throat> so that's another important problem. And uh, right, so I'll I'll say more about these problems uh, when we get uh, further in here. But there there are different kinds of models for the for this type of problem. And and I and I categorize categorize these. Uh, according to uh, an underlying smoothness <clears throat> that you're using in your model. And the, the least smooth formulation for this type of problem is what I call a feasibility formulation, where you've got these, these sets CJ that I, that I um, described up above here, this, and possibly this C0. And I just want to find an intersection, any point in the intersection of all of these sets. I'm not asking for much except that this intersection is non-empty. Turns out that that's actually asking quite a lot. Um, and in most applications, this intersection will be empty. So you need to be able to deal with that. Um, there's a product space form formulation, which formally is the same as a feasibility problem, but it's a feasibility problem on, on a product space. So here, you just imagine that you're gonna make M copies of either your, your signal or um, your potential molecule and, and just uh, and say that, and, and sort of do this in parallel. You've got your guess naught and guess one and up to guess M and you take, take elements in each one of those sets. Uh, so it's easy to be in the, the set on the product space corresponding to this, um, this sort of product set, but then we're going to intersect it with another set D, which is going to force me to communicate with all these other copies of myself. And D is going to be the dia diagonal of the, of the product space, which says this component of my product space has to be equal to that component, has to be equal to all the other components. So, so by saying, oh yeah, I can just pick any point, belongs to this set, belongs to this set, belongs to this set, ah, but this set, if I'm going to be in the intersection with this set, then they all have to be the same point. So it's the same thing as requiring this, but it's just a different modeling uh, format. But this opens up the door to different algorithmic strategies that wouldn't be apparent 
if you formulated things like this. <clears throat> and I'm going to argue uh, later that, that this is a, a way of kind of sneaking in smoothness uh, into your model. And then we go down to smooth optimization. And this is just the, the usual thing that people start with. It's just minimize the square distance to all the sets. This is a smooth objective. You can compute derivatives of this and you can you apply your uh, nonlinear optimization to that immediately without thinking too much about it. Russell, can I yeah. just ask one quick question? Yeah. Um, so the, this product space formulation, uh, it, that seems to be, well, it seems to have the flavor of making everything separable, like in, a, in, a, in an optimization uh, yeah. problem context. Yeah. And then you're, for, and then you're enforcing basically uh, consensus or something like yeah. that, right? Yeah. 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 Um, the separability is just by design here. This is yeah. the way you've constructed it. And then, yeah, the consensus, that's a nice way to put it. This, this can be enforced by this set D, but this allows you to kind of parallelize algorithms and do things like that. So what you can't do in, in, in this formulation. So <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, now regardless of, 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 which of these model formats we take, we can we can still look at this as a as an optimization problem, minimize some function subject to a constraint set, <clears throat> where uh, each of those sets we can consider those as a function by just taking the indicator function to that set. The indicator function being the function that takes the value zero when you're in the set and infinity when you're not in the set. And so you've know, got an optimization problem of this format. Your first order optimality conditions are find zero in the subdifferential of this. And then you have to solve this inclusion. So you set up some, some uh, you can rewrite this. This is a zero finding problem. You can rewrite that as a fixed point problem. And then once you got a fixed point problem, you can apply your fixed point iteration. And this, this operator T, hopefully the zeros of this operator T have something to do with the solution to this problem, and hopefully the solution to this problem has something to do with the solutions to that problem. But going back up this cascade um, is really what variational analysis is about. Um, I'm going to start, however, and focus this whole talk on just fixed point iterations and uh, show you how um, the various model formulations uh, lead to different kinds of T's that you would choose here, these T's being the algorithms, and uh, you get different rates of convergence of this fixed point iteration. Um, it's, it's, it's quite a long path going from the fixed points of this operator back up to your optimization problem. And I'll say a little bit about that, but um, that's just the hard analysis part. <clears throat> so we've got our, our fixed point iteration, we're generating some sequence. You can also do relaxations of this. Um, and these are always, you always call it an acceleration because that's what you want to do is accelerate this guy. Um, <clears throat> and what this T is, it's going to be a composition or average of prox mappings. The prox mappings will be, you know, if, if you're more familiar with PDEs, those are implicit steps in a, in a PDE solver, or maybe steepest descent steps, and those will be like explicit steps in a, in a, a PDE solver. We have to assume that the fixed point set's non-empty. We don't get that for free. Um, and uh, we're not going to do any step size adjustment. So there are lots of things you can do to you know, tweak things at every iteration. But I, I like algorithms where there's only one parameter, if any, and you just let the thing go. And so then the question is, you're going to, of course, you can't, you can't let this run forever. You've got to stop at some point. And when you stop, question is, how far away are you from the solution? And the only way you can answer that question is if you get quantitative convergence results of this guy. And so that's what I'm after. <clears throat> okay, so the basic result that I'm building um, this whole framework on, this is a, a quantitative convergence result um, <clears throat> that I started uh, the first formal uh, um, statement of all this stuff was in a um, math of operations research paper together with Matt Tam and uh, my former student, Tao Nguyen. Um, so you've got a multi-valued mapping 
um, I'm not assuming convexity or anything. So these, these, these mappings T, if you think of it as like a projection or something like this, uh, if we've got non-convex set, that projection doesn't need to be single valued. So my fixed point mapping that's built on that doesn't need to be single valued too. So these are set value mappings. That's what this double arrow here means. And I've got some set that's, that's in the relative interior of this set D. D is going to be, it could be some sub, subspace or a sub-manifold of my, of my bigger Euclidean space. So that's what this, this um, E stands for. And, um, and I'm going to suppose that for points on this S, when I, when I apply my mapping T to points in S, I go immediately to fixed points. Okay, so uh, the, the, the set, the, this is a, probably a, 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 a gratuitous generalization, but it, it actually turns out to be helpful in some, some cases to allow yourself to consider points that aren't in the fixed point set, but would get, you would get there in one step, in one application of the operator T. Um, and so we're going to look at a neighborhood of this. Um, intersected with D because D doesn't have to have interior or anything like that. But as long as this neighborhood intersected with D is in the relative interior of D, that's all we'll require. And then we're going to use this object. This is just all you're doing is looking at the differences of the residuals of the points X and Y under the mapping T. That's, that's what this is. Now this, there's a, there's a much bigger story behind this guy. And and the only reason it looks so obvious here as being a distance of residuals is because I'm in a Hilbert space. Um, I've been working lately with uh, some students on <clears throat> doing all of this in, in nonlinear spaces where I don't have addition and subtraction. And there, it's a, there's, a, there's a bigger story to this. And, and we call this, this mapping the discrepancy, um, the discrepancy mapping. It shows you the sort of the discrepancy between, it's sort of, I mean, it, it, it tells you in one way, it tells you how far away you are from the fixed points, but it also tells you how, how badly your operator is behaving at points as well. <clears throat> so, so given this, this key object, I'm going to define two properties that I need to get the, to get the kinds of results I, I want. So my, my fixed point mapping T, uh, is what this this inequality is called pointwise almost uh, almost firm uh, pointwise almost alpha firm non expansiveness. What that is is you've got an alpha in zero and one, you've got an epsilon in zero to one, and these are points in the image of x and y under t. So and and these points satisfy this inequality, and this inequality if you forget this part just ignore that for a second. This the first part of this inequality is just Lipschitz continuity with a constant slightly bigger than one. That's what that is. <clears throat> but I'm going to require even more. It's a little bit more than that. Minus this one over alpha, uh, one minus alpha over alpha times this discrepancy uh, mapping here. <clears throat> and that's what I'm going to call almost alpha firm non-expansiveness. So the almost refers to this epsilon violation of non-expansiveness here. Okay, and this has to this inequality has to hold for all elements in the image of y under t, for all elements in the image of x under t, whenever x is in this set d. Okay, <clears throat> the second um, uh, thing I'm going to require of this mapping t is that there's a neighborhood of the fixed points. And some kappa greater than zero, such that for all elements in the image of y under t, so now these points from this are fixed points. So these this, these are fixed points here, and all elements in the image of of x under t, this estimate holds. Now this is an estimate uh, on the the discrepancy mapping here, and it just says that the distance of our point x, the original point x, to the set s is bounded above by this. And the discrepancy operator tells us, tells us that. Okay. And it's for all points x away, now v is a neighborhood of the fixed point sets. So 
X can't be in the set of fixed points or in the set S even. Um, oh no, actually just not in the fixed points. Um, but it's, it's still in this neighborhood O, this neighborhood of the fixed points. So, so really uh, I've got a, I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna switch to drawing. Um, what I'm describing here, uh, I'm gonna switch to a pen if I can find a pen. Why am I not finding a pen? I'm finding an eraser. Uh, I don't want a uh, format. Okay, let's try this. Can I draw this? So, no, this is the eraser. I'm not seeing a pen on my, let me see, just a second. Here, annotate. Good, I've got a pen. So, these are my fixed points. I take a neighborhood of the fixed points, forget the set S, let's just say that S is the, the fixed points. So this is my neighborhood O. And then I'm gonna take a neighborhood of the fixed points that's still in O. So this is my neighborhood V. And so the statement is only going to concern points in here, in this annular region around the fixed point set initially. But if all of those conditions that I talked about on the previous slide are satisfied, then, okay, I'm back to the spotlight. Then <clears throat> for all points in the image, the distance of the next point of this, of this image point to the fixed points is less than the distance of the previous point to the, to the set S by this factor. Well, okay, I didn't say that this factor is less than one, but, uh, this factor will be less than one as long as kappa and epsilon are in the, the, the right proportion to each other. And that happens whenever X is on this, this annular region. So it just tells you, what this tells me is, gives me a rate of convergence of my fixed point iteration through this annular region. And if I can take this neighborhood V arbitrarily close to the fixed point sets, it'll get me my rate of convergence all the way up to the set of fixed points there. But the reason I allow these annular regions is so that I can capture nonlinear convergence, um, sort of sublinear, sublinear convergence. Is there any relation to metric subregularity? Because well, that's what that's exactly what B is. It's yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's metric subregularity of this discrepancy. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so. Well, S or yeah, I guess. Yeah. 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 At at the points. So yeah, at the points S. So I gotta get rid of this. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> so this gives you an error bound. As long as kappa is bounded above and below by this, then actually this this term out front is indeed less than one, and that's your that's your error bound. And it tells you if you stop the algorithm at iteration k, this tells you how far away uh, you are from the set of fixed points in principle possibly. Um, the first property with those calling alpha, alpha firm non-expansiveness, um, this is relatively easy to verify. You could give this to somebody as a master's project. Uh, metric subregularity is really hard to show. And um, I just had one student graduate in 2020 showing metric subregularity uh, for the relaxed Douglas Ratchford algorithm for spheres <laughs> as a hard problem. How, do, how does the uh, how does it look? Is it do you show metric regularity and hence metric subregularity, or can you show that actually metric regularity won't hold, but metric subregularity does hold? Uh, no, actually, we go an even crazier route. Uh, so, um, for people in the crowd who know Boris Morozovic uh, and that crowd, they claim that you can directly verify this condition B here by computing the co-derivative of this mapping or the co-derivative of this mapping phi, <clears throat> which, um, uh, and I've said, I would be, I would love to see that paper. Uh, send it to me as soon as you get it. And I haven't heard back from them. So I go through an even crazier route. I, can only do this for feasibility. Um, 
and I go through geometric properties of the sets in relation to each other called transversality. So I wrote a paper with Alex Kruger and Tao Nguyen um, showing the relationship between metric subregularity and, and transversality or subtransversality of sets, collections of sets and things like that. So there's a very geometric uh, interpretation of this property um, <clears throat> that, that, we, that we use. And that's exactly what I used uh, together with my student to show this particular property holds for, uh, for in particular, I can go back to my, my pen here. Um, I think, let's see, pen. Uh, I, we can show if you've got a set that does, this is a sphere. Spheres in relation to each other like this, we've got metric subregularity of fixed points of certain nice algorithms for spheres that are like this, you got metric subregularity. Obviously for spheres that intersect, you got metric subregularity. Um, but for spheres that are just tangential, you don't have metric subregularity. <clears throat> and for spheres that are perfectly concentric, we don't know the answer to that question. That's open. So, oh, now I have to erase all this. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, uh, go back to spotlight. Nope. Oh, this. Yeah, okay. I do I have to erase this? No, it's not going to let me erase that. I'm going back to this. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> oh, that's, that's really annoying. How do I get rid of that? I'll just put it out over there. Oh, I just said out. Um, <laughs> uh, I would like to advertise also the Prox Toolbox. And so now I encourage you, uh, while you're getting bored with this talk, to, uh, to wander uh, over to this address. <clears throat> and you can download all the software I have for running numerical experiments on some of the data sets I'll show you in this talk. All the data that you have to date, you, you download the software separately from the data sets, but the links are all there. And if you run the, uh, the Python version of the, of the software, it'll ask you if you want to download the, the, uh, the data for it automatically, and then it'll download it for you. But I didn't put those together because the data is like gigabyte size. So, um, so that just makes it more portable. So again, uh, if, if we're looking at the model category one feasibility, these are the kinds of algorithms that, that you'll see in that, in that category. There's cyclic projections where you just project cyclically through all of the, the constraint sets that you have. And, you've, and this relies on these projectors being easy to calculate, which they are. Um, you just replace the magnitude with the measured magnitude, keep the phase and that, that's your projection. There's the Douglas Ratchford algorithm where these R's are the reflectors. I put that here, that's the reflector, it's built on the projector. So if you know how to compute the projector, you can compute the reflector. The Douglas Ratchford algorithm doesn't converge if these sets, if this intersection is empty. So that's why I proposed this relaxed Douglas Ratchford algorithm. <clears throat> um, and this converges where that is not. Uh, but it doesn't converge to you know, intersection points if, if they don't exist, but um, they converge to some point that if you then project back onto B will give you a best approximation point. So these are reasonable points. And then Tao Nguyen um, came up with a, this, this algorithm here, which you can look at as in a certain setting and when C naught and C1 are linear or, or affine subspaces, then, uh, then this is just a convex combination of alternating projections and Douglas Ratchford. And this does slightly better than the relaxed Douglas Ratchford algorithm and Tao did all the analysis for this in a 2019 paper just as he graduated. Um, so the algorithms in red only work for two sets. Uh, so that's one uh, bug in the ointment. Uh, for these. Um, and these sets are non-convex, so the, these mappings are all set valued in general. Um, Multi-set extensions of the algorithms in red are the cyclic versions. So you go, you go set, you take just pairs of sets 
set zero, set one, set one, set two, set two, set three, and so forth. And then you just keep cycling around. Um, and that was first explored by John Borwine and Matt Tam in 2014. And they were motivated mostly to look at that because of this empty intersection possibility. And this algorithm will converge even when the intersection is, is empty. Uh, and this is just built from the Douglas Ratchford algorithm. So this was a way that they could get Douglas Ratchford to behave. Um, uh, Heinz Bauschke shortly thereafter considered an anchored version of that where you, you, always, you always keep the, the not set in your mix. So it's not one, not two, not three, not four, up to not M, and then you cycle around. Um, and then I uh, just, uh, for the heck of it, looked at my, the relaxed Douglas Ratchford algorithm uh, more along this model, and, uh, and I've got some numerical results on that algorithm. Um, but the analysis of these, what these fixed points are in their relation to some reasonable optimization is quite difficult. Uh, you can also do ADMM for this with non-smooth functions. Uh, if you're familiar with ADMM, the alternating direction method of multipliers by Globinski and Morocco. Um, so here you just, you just put indicator functions everywhere. And these are, these are your, your points in the, <clears throat> uh, these will be your points to kind of parallelize this whole thing. And uh, the VJs are your Lagrange multipliers. Uh, and so anyway, this would be your Lagrangian to this, uh, associated with this, and then you can apply ADMM to this, this Lagrangian. Um, it's very interesting. It, it doesn't work very well, but um, it, it's, I, I would still want to look at it more myself and I'll sort of show you some results with that in a, in a bit. Um, now the product space formulations, again, we just take all these sets, put them on a product space, and we have D as the diagonal. This is the diagonal of the product space. And so then we just do alternating projections between these two sets. And the projection onto the diagonal is easy. It's just the average of the points. Um, <clears throat> so that's easy. The projectors onto the individual sets is easy. And you can parallelize this because you can, you can send each of these projectors to a specific GPU or CPU as you wish. Um, and so you can get some very fast uh, implementations of this. Um, and so the interesting thing is, as some of you know, is that alternating projections on the product space, that's what this is, is the same as averaged projections in this formulation. So there's a relationship between these. But this is uh, where I say that, that formulating things on the product space is a subtle way of smoothing the problem because um, the projected gradient algorithm uh, the, the projected gradient is where you project onto the set C. The set C is, is again, it's the product space of, of all the sets C1 through CM or C0 through CM. And you project the, this is the steepest descent direction that you would go in by computing the gradient of the, the distance squared to the set D. <clears throat> this, is, this is differentiable, so this gradient makes sense. And this is just a steepest descent, descent direction. You, you project that onto the set C. That's actually equivalent to alternating projections if you take lambda equal to one half. So, um, so the product space formulation, uh, if you did alternating projections on the product space uh, formulation, you would in fact be doing um, uh, projected gradients. And there's the smoothing that you're doing implicitly in that. <clears throat> You can also do relaxed Douglas Ratchford on this product space. You can do Tal Nguyen's uh, DRAP algorithm. Um, but anyway, so that's the implicit smoothing of this. Smooth optimization, this is, this is fairly clear. It's an unconstrained, just minimize the square dis sum of square distances to all the sets. Um, you can reformulate that in terms of your physical model for the data that you have. And all of the, this is a really nice objective function. That's great. Uh, you can compute gradients, uh, but the projector comes in again because the gradient of of this of this function is built from the projectors. So, um, so this even if you go to this totally smooth format, um, the gradient descent for this is nothing more than averaged projections. So. 
Um, but this thing has an advantage that average projections has is you could do quasi Newton accelerations to this. You can do all kinds of smooth optimization tricks to, to improve the performance of your algorithm from this format where it's not exactly obvious how you would do that in this format. But there's no step size optimization. Also, there's no step size optimization in this average projection. Uh, whereas if you go to um, steepest descents, you would obviously try to optimize your step, <clears throat> your step size. Uh, I'll skip over this because I'm running out of time very quickly. Uh, but you can also optimize the, the weights out, out front here. Um, and that gets you to a dynamically reweighted uh, projection algorithm, and I'll skip over this. There's a smoothing of the ADMM algorithm, and this is another uh, work that I did together with Shom Sabach and Mark Tibur. Um, <coughs> uh, and as I mentioned, you can do quasi-Newton's accelerations of this. Um, other approaches that I'm not discussing in this framework, phase lift, uh, which if, if some of you have heard it, it's, it involves taking um, this model, if you notice this, this model, um, if you put a square on this, square each of these terms, it's a, uh, it's a quadratic model, which then if, if you can do some tricks with, uh, um, with traces and things and, and blow this problem up to a problem on a space of matrices of dimension D times N times D times N, so D times N squared. <clears throat> and and then on the space of matrices, you, you would find, try to find a rank one matrix that, that solves a linear equation. Um, and there was a lot of excitement around that, but you can't, the, blowing this problem up to a n squared or d times n squared um, dimensional problem is a non-starter for any of the experiments that I ran here, and um, and we just found that it, it didn't it didn't even it wasn't even implementable on any of the the real live experiments we were doing in this collaborative research center. So um, it's a cute idea, but it's not it's not serious, I don't think. Inverting a flow is nothing more than gradient descent in the Fourier domain um, of these of these uh, X-ray imaging uh, things. So so that's also not a <clears throat> not a particularly attractive uh, algorithm, but a lot of people have been writing about this. So I do do benchmarking against that as well. Uh, this is just, uh, if you want to look later, this is sort of my assessment of where we are with the theory on the convergence of all of these things in model category one, the, the, the feasibility for uh, cyclic projections, we've got the local analysis down. <clears throat> um, global analysis is also really well well uh, figured. Rates uh, globally, that's in the convex setting, we got it, but non-convex, that's a little trickier. <clears throat> uh, the, the cyclic Douglas Ratchford and all of these versions, there's, there's quite a bit to explore here on those is the rates. Uh, the critical points characterizing those, uh, so far we can only do that for the convex case. So there's a lot to be done on those. The ADMM algorithm, um, <clears throat> Jerome Bolt, uh, uh, Shoham and Mark have uh, studied that both globally and locally. And so that's pretty well understood. But the rates, that's still, still kind of open <clears throat> for non-convex problems. The product space, um, in the product space, we've got everything. The local picture is, is really well uh well figured out for all of these algorithms um <clears throat> and uh globally in the convex setting we can say something but we can say nothing about rates um about these globally anyway um, and that's as expected because for non-convex problems um i just don't believe there exists a global theory other than that you're going to converge to some sort of critical point that would be nice to get in the non-convex setting um, <clears throat> model category three, the smooth optimization approach, the verting of flow belongs to that. Um, a lot of this is the averaged projections, projected gradients, alternating projections. This is really well understood, global to local. Um, but there are a lot of minus signs around here for the various other algorithms that we look at. Benchmarking results. <clears throat> um, the first data set that I benchmarked all these different algorithms on was the JWST uh, data set. This is the James Webb Space Telescope data set. 
that I was given in the course of my PhD studies in Seattle. I was a, a NASA graduate student uh, researcher, so I had to spend summers in Washington, D.C., uh, which is the only reason for living in Seattle is for the summers. And then I had to go spend my summers in Washington, D.C., which is the only reason for not living in D.C. is the summers. Um, so, but I did get this great project to work with. Uh, the true phase for this uh, telescope looks like this. And the data sets I'm not showing for this, but you have three data sets, three images that they take um, of the telescope uh, in and out of focus. Uh, and then you use those three data sets to figure out what the what the phase aberration of the telescope is. Um, and each of these panels is one meter or two meters across. So this is a six meter telescope. It's gonna go up probably in 2021, 2022. Um, when I started this in, 2000, in 1998, they said it was gonna go up in 2007. Um, but this is the sort of the pictures that various uh, algorithms will deliver. Now, this is physicists will show you these kinds of pictures and say, "Ah, this is my my algorithm solves the problem." But this is just an iterate of the algorithm. You have no idea if this algorithm has converged. In fact, in this one, the algorithm doesn't converge by any mathematical measure. But if you look at the picture, it looks great. So a physicist would be happy with this. Um, the Wertinger flow idea does it gets stuck in a local minimum, and so that the Douglas Ratchford, you see something that looks familiar, but the Douglas Ratchford, this is just one iterate. If you look at a different iterate, you might see, you'll see something completely different. And that's just, the Douglas Ratchford doesn't converge here. Um, and most of these other algorithms actually do converge, uh, except for this one, as I said, uh, and the dynamically reweighted one, actually it converges, but to a point that is too far away from the true phase. So we say that this fails, but if you look at the picture, again, a physicist would be perfectly happy for, with this. Um, so what I use to, to compare the behavior of the different algorithms is a mathematical uh, criterion, not a physical criterion. And because the optimization problems I'm solving are not some, you know, you know minimize some physical criterion that would make the physicist happy. I'm, the optimization problem I'm solving is find as, as nearly as possible the intersection of these sets. And if, if, uh, if there's no intersection, then try to find the best approximation point. So that's how I evaluate the performance of these different algorithms. And so, so for, for instance, on this data set, failure, the way I do this with noise and without noise, failure means did I get to within a reasonable uh, computational distance of the true solutions. I know the true solution to this one. And, and they were all given the same threshold uh, to satisfy. Uh, Douglas Ratchard, strangely enough, Douglas Ratchard actually does uh, satisfy the, the threshold uh, um, 32 times out of 100, um, but it doesn't converge. So I don't know what that should mean. Um, so this is an interesting thing. But with noise, if you put in noise, Douglas Ratchard fails 100% of the time. Um, so does this non-smooth ADMM, fails 100% of the time. Uh, the cyclic Douglas Ratchford of uh, Matt Tam and John Borwine also fails 100% of the time with noisy problems. Whereas if there's no noise, it, it does great. It's a, I mean, it converges sometimes in nine iterations. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, the cyclic relaxed Douglas Ratchford algorithm, it, uh, the variance high and low can be quite a bit, but on average it, it converges after just 25 iterations. And an iteration only costs you, uh, for this example, three, three fast Fourier transforms on a 512 by 512 image. So, uh, so this, is, this will converge in the order of a half a minute. That, that's what that will be. Um, and if you add noise, it does not affect the performance of the algorithm at all. You still get the same number of medium. So, so noise is actually, um, for a lot of scientists, they think oh, noise is, is a bad thing. Actually, noise doesn't change the structure of the problem at all. And that's really reflected in this result. The structure of the problem stays exactly the same. I, I just converge to a different point. Uh, and, and also, but it also destroys the intersection if there's anything like an intersection in the problem. And that would be reflected 
the so this column would show you how various algorithms behave in in for inconsistent problems versus this is actually a consistent problem um, so obviously douglas ratchford totally craps out for inconsistent problems so does this admm uh, this is douglas ratchford but most of the alg other algorithms can muscle their way through um, <clears throat> uh, even for inconsistent problems but the another thing to notice is that these these algorithms that come from model category one are significantly better and the more than than these other model categories and the more smooth your your model gets the worse your algorithm does in general um, but what these smooth uh, algorithms have uh, at their disposal is is acceleration techniques that can get them uh, within shooting range of of these very fast first order methods um, so so that's uh, that stuff. There, there are some other interesting features here that that uh, I could, uh, I'll skip over just in the interest of time. Um, uh, for the source sensor localization problem, this is just to show you that a very different physical problem, but with the same mathematical structure, yields pretty much qualitatively the same kinds of benchmarking results. So the. the um, so this is just to convince people that it's nothing, there's really nothing special about phase retrieval versus sensor location, noise versus no noise. Uh, the behavior of the algorithms qualitatively between these different model categories is, is, is pretty much the same. And this is with the experimental data that I got uh, from the physicists at Göttingen. Um, this is an inline synchrotron radiation experiment. <clears throat> they, they take first an empty beam measurement and this shows you that the, the pulse, the, the laser pulse, is not uniform. And then they stick an object in there, and this is what they view, this is what they see. And from this object, they subtract out the empty beam, and that's the image that they get. And they want to they clean up this image. And if you naively apply these algorithms to the full data set from these physicists, it has noise and everything in it. Uh, I apply, so what I call the relaxed Douglas Ratchford algorithm, the physicists call the rare algorithm uh, because of the first few papers I published on this for relaxed averaged alternating reflections. Um, and you apply that algorithm to us, you'll, you'll get something that looks like maybe it's linear convergence. I show in one graph, this is the log of the distance of the gap distance between the sets. And now this is converging to something like 10 to the minus four, it's an inconsistent problem. But if you look at the, the log of the change of the iterates, the theory suggests or predicts that you'll get uh, Q linear convergence. And that's exactly what this shows you. It's a very slow Q linear convergence, but Q linear convergence nonetheless. Um, but oddly enough, the, the images that you recover are awful. You're, you're recovering noise on this. And so, um, so there's the way you deal with that is you stop the algorithm early and you can explain stopping the algorithm early <clears throat> to, uh, as, as basically regularizing the problem by blowing up, um, I, I need to pull down my annotating pen here by blowing up the sets. So, <clears throat> so the sets, these phase sets look like this. Okay, and so let's say one of the phase sets is like this, and I have a support constraint. That's a that's a linear constraint, and it's an inconsistent problem. <clears throat> so I've got something like this, and you know, consistent because of noise or whatever. Um, now, if I if I iterate my so let's look at just alternating projections. You know, I'm I'm at this point. I project here, I project down here, I project here here, and I'm and I'm going to go very slowly to my best approximation point, which is here. If <clears throat> I blow a ball around my phase set and I start here and I project onto this ball and then I project down here onto my other set, I'm in the intersection of these sets in just two iterations. But, but that's really, now what happens if instead of projecting onto the ball that I blew up around the set, I actually project onto the set as I would have 
as I did before. And then I project back down onto my other set. At this point, I'm in the intersection of my blown up regularized ball and my, my other constraint set. So I would stop there. So that's early termination of my algorithm viewed from uh, cyclic projections. And the other algorithms follow the same kind of logic to, to explain uh, early termination. <clears throat> and, and, uh, and these, so these are sort of showing where the, the algorithms have reached the, the termination criterion. And the images that I get are, are much better because I'm not reconstructing the noise on this problem anymore. Um, <clears throat> and so, so that's, these are the images that I get with the various algorithms. Of course, this is what the physicists are interested in, but mathematically, this is what I use to determine whether the algorithm can stop, whether it's reached the intersection of those balls. <clears throat> okay, uh, so that's, I'm done. Um, sorry, I went a little bit over. Uh, the main publications that I'd like to draw your attention to um, on uh, this talk are uh, the Prox Toolbox. Um, do, do play with this and um, I will answer your emails if you remind me that you set in on this, this seminar and, um, and downloaded this and we're having trouble uh, getting it to work. I will, I will try to help walk you through uh, getting it, getting this up and running. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to draw your attention to this this paper with uh, my former student Anna Martins, where we analyzed the relaxed Douglas Ratchford algorithm and showed finally that I first proposed this algorithm in 2004, and it's taken me this long to show that it actually converges locally linearly for the phase retrieval problem. Um, and then this is the big um, MOR paper, which I call the monster paper. It's, it's not an easy read, but it's basically where I set up this whole framework and do the first few examples of non-convex, the analysis for non-convex problems and cyclic projections and a few other algorithms. <clears throat> and in a paper with Mark Tabu and, and Tan Yuen, we actually showed that this metric subregularity, the hardest condition to show, is in fact necessary uh, for linear convergence. So if you have a linearly convergent sequence for uh, say alternating projections sequence, <clears throat> then uh, the, the operator associated with that uh, satisfies this metric subregularity condition. <clears throat> um, and then of course the, the big book, Nanoscale Photonic Imaging, which you can download for free. This, this article is also for free. It's open source, that's open source. And with that, I'll stop and thanks for your attention and be happy to answer questions. <clears throat> Silent uh, clapping. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's uh, time for questions. Thanks a lot, first, first of all. Uh, for the for the very very interesting talk, I have quite a few questions, but I'd encourage people in the, in the audience to ask questions maybe first. I think everything everything was pretty clear. <laughs> if, if I can open, uh, let's see, I can't see if if uh, somehow I can't find the chat button. Let's just see if somebody I, wants. The chat. Oh, but yeah, you don't need to use the chat. I think there aren't so many of us that we can just open your mic and. Well, I I was uh, I was still wondering. Um, so you didn't so did you didn't use any co-derivative uh, criterion for a very fine metric subregularity, but I mean the mm -hmm. what, I guess what 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 they mean is I mean there is no like straight up co-derivative criterion for metric subregularity there that i mean that's that's metrics metric regularity right like the murdochovich criterion or or bound property for the inverse but but there there are these directional uh conditions for metric subregularity right right, right. but <clears throat> I, I don't think they are easy <laughs> but basically you're saying it it's already it's it's for a given operator t, computing the the co-derivative is 
is almost out of reach or? Well, here's my, here's my challenge to you. Say T is the Douglas Ratchford operator. Yeah. Compute just the, compute the, der, compute the co-derivative of the Douglas Ratchford operator. Okay. How do you do it? I don't know how to do it. Compute the co-derivative of a projection. Start with that. That's hard enough. I, I would agree. Well, I mean, yeah. If there is a, a on onto a not even even for a convex set, that's hard. Yeah. But yours are all spheres, right? Right. Right. Okay. Um. Yeah. I guess. I guess. It is hard. I mean, what is easier is computing graphical derivatives, but usually those don't give you the right criteria for, right. for, for metrics, mm. metric subregularity. Because I've, I've been computing a lot of these recently, um, but essentially for monotone operators or subdifferentials of convex functions, that's okay. Like I mean, you get, at least get like uh, qu like qualitative statements, but. Yeah, I guess it's 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 very hard. Yeah. And so what I was wondering these these constraint sets which are spheres you always have these equality chart like these straight up equality constraints like the norm of the affine map of something equals some number. But mm -hmm. um like is there do you like regularize or like relax that constraints in the algorithms right away or do you, do you use like the sharp like the sharp constraints for these for these spheres okay or do you if, have a strip if you dig into the code you go to the prox toolbox and you look at uh magproj the projection onto a magnitude constraint yeah. you'll see a very complicated looking formula for that okay um and that formula is I'm not putting a strip around the sphere. I'm only safeguarding against zero because zero. Um, so the, the somewhere here, zero, the projector goes to the entire sphere. <clears throat> and what I do in my code is, okay, I see. yeah, if I'm, if I'm, too close to zero in my code, I just stay put. I don't move anywhere. Because there's a risk of making a, a very big computational error, and it goes like this. Suppose my true point is here. Um, so if I computed the projection onto my sphere, I would go here. Yes. But suppose because of round off error, my computer returns oh, this see. point. Yeah. Yeah, Instead, I go over here, which is a huge error. Right. So it's better to stay put. That's the only thing I do. That's technically different than a projection. Okay. So far, nobody has complained to me for uh, false advertising. Um, <clears throat> and but, I, I was also curious, I mean, I'm, I'm like, I guess by training more more in the in the metric subregularity school than in the transversality school. So what what is the I mean like maybe simplify it or like the the idea behind transfers transversality of that operator or or I guess the the set rather. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, Alex Kruger likes to describe it as as um, uh, a type of separability. So <clears throat> these, the intersection of these sets at these points is actually metrically regular because I can bump the sets by a little bit and the intersection doesn't go too far away. So the, it's, the metric, Transversality is the property that the intersection points are uh, stable under perturbations of the sets. That's that's metric. That's transversality, which is metric regularity. Now, that whole notion doesn't make any sense if the sets don't intersect. Oops. 
I'm good in here. So we got sets like this and this. So uh, I have a definition of transversality that works for sets that don't intersect. But uh, this is where Alex Kruger and I parted ways. Um, and I don't think that uh, Alec Yoffe would like to acknowledge the existence of this kind of thing either. Um, <clears throat> and here, um, why is this metrically subregular? Whereas, um, whereas this situation is not, where they're just tangential. Well, in this case, if you go back to Alex Kruger's notion, where they're just transversal and you bump the sets by a little bit, the intersection goes from being existent to non-existent. That's a pretty big change. <clears throat> so um, my, my definition of transversality, it, it kind of is related to the, to the stability of the gap under perturbations of the sets. And basically it just amounts to the, the gap vector being robust under perturbations. <clears throat> Thanks to everyone for, for uh, coming and staying so long. And again, I'd like to repeat my offer. Uh, if you uh, are brave enough to um, dig into the Prox toolbox, I will, I will um, be sure to try to help you get on your feet with that. Uh, so. Ariel, that would be good for you. Uh, my, one of my undergraduate students who is doing a project with me, we're, we're doing a lot of proximal stuff. Okay. Yeah. And he's, he's, a, he's a CS student also. So he, I think he would be brave enough. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not proud. Actually, the, the MATLAB programming is mine. I, I did a, uh, almost all of that. The Python programming is not mine. I'm just right now sitting together with students trying to learn the damn thing. Um, so you, you're welcome to criticize the MATLAB uh, programs if you like. Uh, the, the, the Python code, um, you know, actually it was Sylvain Gretzkin uh, uh, who did the Python code for me, got it actually working. And, and uh, Warren Hare knows Sylvain from, uh, UBC Okanagan. Yeah, Warren had to. Warren was one of the people who uh, who said he had to dash. Yeah. Had, yeah. Had, he's even he's even three hours behind us now. Yeah. So he's nine hours behind you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, I think uh, we we uh, set you free so you can go to bed. Okay. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks again for the yeah. opportunity. And yeah. Thanks. For, for, for the great talk and well uh, hang in there in the in the lockdown we're, we're, we're now in red alert that's oh what man oh, that's awful <laughs> well stay strong yeah okay bye russell cheers everybody bye